Okay, now I'm going to um, give you an example of uh, another patient of ours uh, for whom we use the NeuroQuant extended analysis. And this is a, a patient who was 46 years old, involved in a motor vehicle accident. She suffered a mild traumatic brain injury. She had a lot of persistent neuropsychiatric symptoms, cognitive impairment like trouble with uh, concentration, attention, memory, dysphoria, depression, anxiety, uh, impaired sleep and wakefulness, uh, insomnia, uh, fatigue during the day. And this uh, is her brain MRI um, after the accident and it's a coronal section like the early ones we talked about, a section approximately through this part of the brain and head. And the radiologist interpreted this MRI as normal. We did a NeuroQuant extended analysis on, on her MRI data and you can see here uh, the brain, uh, the segmented DICOM, which is the um, colored brain image that NeuroQuant uh, produces. And it's easier to see on this image that there's some asymmetry in the brain. Um, probably anybody can see that the left lateral ventricle, which is on the right side of your image, was bigger than her right lateral ventricle, which is on the left side of your image. Again, it's as if the patient is facing you. Um, and it clearly looks asymmetrical. Anyone can see that. The question is, is it abnormal or not? Uh, and the radiologist thought that this was within the normal range. But uh, the radiologist, like most or all uh, radiologists who do this based on visual inspection, they don't actually measure the ventricular volume. So we did measure that with NeuroQuant and in our group of normal controls. And we found that her lateral ventricles were asymmetric. Uh, the left lateral ventricle was 70, about 74 percent bigger than the right and this was abnormal at the 100.0 normative percentile. That means it was much more asymmetric than all 20 of our normal controls. So much so that if we had measured more normal controls we would estimate that she had more asymmetry of her ventricles than let's say a hundred normal controls if we if we would actually have measured that many. So clearly uh, her, her ventricles were asymmetric. Furthermore, uh, she had asymmetry of her hippocampus, which you can see in this image as well. That's the gold colored region down here. And you, you can see her right hippocampus looks approximately normal volume. And on the left, the hippocampus is so small that you can barely see it or might not be able to see it all. Uh, and the NeuroQuant extended results confirmed that the left hippocampus was significantly smaller than the right, that she had abnormal asymmetry. Um, and that uh, raised uh, concerns about how her impaired memory might be related to the hippocampal abnormality. Now in this movie, um, we have a, a different patient's brain, but for the sake of illustration, we're again going through the NeuroQuant segmented DICOM images on the right, the colored images, and our medical illustrator that we work with, Michael Havronik, has identified each of these uh, different brain regions and outlined them using uh, computer techniques uh, so that we can produce some medical illustrations to try to help, help you or help other people who are interested understand uh, what these brain regions look like and what it means when someone has abnormally small brain regions, for example. Going through the thalamus there. Ventricles, putamen. And here, uh, the medical illustrator took those brain regions um, and created three-dimensional reconstructions, as you can see here. This technique allows us to get a, a better uh, three-dimensional feel for the solid structures we're dealing with instead of only being able to look at them in cross-section. Sometimes it's good to look at them in cross-section. Sometimes it's good to look at the three-dimensional structure depending on what you're looking for. Okay, uh, and before we play this one, um, this is a three-dimensional reconstruction of our patient, KM, that we talked about a few minutes ago.
uh, the ventricles deep in her brain. Remember, the ventricles are the fluid-filled spaces, and when the brain is injured, as the brain tissue shrinks or atrophies, the ventricles line next to the brain tissue gets bigger. So enlargement of ventricles is a sign of injury. Okay, go ahead and play it. You can see these are the Neuroquant reconstructed ventricles with the brain overlaid uh, in a translucent figure over it. Uh, and you can see these ventricles are highly asymmetric in this view as well, with the, the left one being much bigger than the right and having a much longer tail toward the bottom. That's the occipital horn, much bigger than on the right. Okay, before we play this video, let me tell you a little bit about this patient. He was a middle-aged man who had an accident at work, was hit in the right frontal part of his head, fractured his skull, and the Neuroquant analysis showed that he had some atrophy on the right side of the brain. Go ahead and play the video. You can see the three-dimensional reconstruction, removing the brain, you can see subcortical structures. We put the brain back, look at the top of his brain, and if you look carefully, you can see on the right that the sulci, which are the deep valleys in between the gyri, which are kind of like the mounds or little hills on the surface of the brain, the sulci are deeper and wider on the right, and they're darker, they're in black. And this illustrates the uh, atrophy on the right cortical areas greater than that on the left. And that was consistent with the Neuroquant finding of uh, asymmetry. Okay, this is a study we recently had accepted for publication in which we compared the ability of radiologists to detect atrophy in our patients with traumatic brain versus Neuroquant's ability to detect atrophy. And this is kind of like the old classic man versus machine contest. Uh, and remember, the traditional radiology technique uh, is to look at the grayscale MRI images one after the other and just based simply on visual inspection, do any regions look abnormally small? Uh, the Neuroquant technique, in contrast, is a quantification, that is measurement of the volume, and then comparing it to the group of normal controls. So when we ask the question, which technique finds at least one sign of atrophy in a given patient, we found that the radiologists found at least one sign of atrophy in two out of our 20 patients with mild traumatic brain injury for a um, detection rate of 10% overall. By contrast, Neuroquant, using the extended analysis approach that I discussed earlier, found at least one sign of atrophy in 10 out of 20 patients, that is 50% of the group. Uh, obviously, that was uh, numerically higher than what the radiologists found, and it was statistically significantly higher um, using a uh, standard statistical test. So basically, Neuroquant is better at detecting atrophy according to this small study. Does that mean we should use Neuroquant instead of radiologists? No. Radiologists still do a lot of things that, that Neuroquant doesn't do, that Neuroquant doesn't try to do. Um, so clearly we, we don't want to replace radiologists with Neuroquant. But we do think Neuroquant is a tool that can complement what the radiologists do. Okay, and here's uh, an example of another one of our patients who had mild traumatic brain injury, and um, his MRIs were read as normal, no signs of atrophy, and, and the Neuroquant extended analysis found uh, signs of atrophy, which we'll illustrate here. Neuroquant also found signs of asymmetry, one side of the brain smaller than its uh, contralateral counterpart side. And we'll look at some of these cross-sectional images in this patient. This is a, a a middle-aged man. Here's a uh, MRI scan done two years after injury, and these are the Neuroquant um, segmented DICOM images, that is the colored brain images. Uh, you can see that the left lateral ventricle is bigger than the right, and the asymmetry was statistically significantly abnormal, according to Neuroquant. Uh, the left hippocampus was smaller than the right, uh, also confirmed by Neuroquant. And furthermore, the left hippocampus was abnormally small compared to the group of normal controls. Uh, this is another uh, MRI Neuroquant image from the same patient. Uh, this time, it's a different cut through the brain. Uh, this is uh, an axial 
image through the brain. Um, and the right side, like with the previous MRI scans, the right side of your screen is the left side of the patient's head, and the left side of your screen is the right side of the patient's head. Uh, I, th I imagine these as a patient lying on a table with his head back and his feet coming toward you. And again, you see that left lateral ventricle bigger than the right, left hippocampus smaller than the right. Uh, and recall, like we said earlier, um, that when the, when the hippocampus shrinks, the ventricle, which is right next to it, gets bigger. So those two things uh, go together. This is another axial cut, uh, just a little bit lower in the brain, just confirming that our visual uh, results here are not simply an artifact of slice level. Okay, now here's the same patient, and we have that MRI scan from two years later. And we were interested in comparing it with the day of accident CT scan, which you see on the left side of your screen. Because we know that in general, in traumatic brain injury, uh, not only does the brain atrophy or shrink after injury, but most of the shrinking occurs early on. It occurs in the, the days, weeks, and months after the injury. And there's a plateau, and over, we think, months and years, eventually uh, the, the abnormally fast rate of shrinking will stop. And so it's always helpful to get a uh, structural brain scan as close to the time of the accident as possible, uh, and then ideally compare it with a later structural brain scan. However, unfortunately, usually we don't have an MRI on the day of the accident. Um, we, would, we would love to get those, and we're, we encourage our colleagues to do that, but it may take a while before that's done on a routine basis. About half the time in our patients, we do have a CT scan on the day of accident, and there is some useful information we can glean from that, although we, we can't do a NERQUAN analysis on that. But we can visually inspect it, compare it to the later MRI, and we can do NERQUAN on the later MRI. Uh, and sometimes this is helpful when you put together these different types of information. So here's an example with this patient. Uh, on the day of accident, um, you can see that compared to the later MRI, uh, his ventricles, lateral ventricles, got larger than on the day of the accident. And by the way, let me tell you how we did this. Um, we, we took the later MRI, which was collected with a technique called 3D, 3D allows us to re-slice the MRI brain data any way we want. And we re-slice that later MRI to match the slice angle of the day of accident CT scan. Um, and then that helps us compare the MRI to the CT scan. We're unable to re-slice the CT scan because it's not co collected with the 3D technique. So you're basically stuck with the slice levels of the CT scan. But that's okay because we can re-slice the later MRI scan and when you do this, you have to be careful because it is very challenging to re-slice the later MRI scan and get it just right to match the CT. But if you do it carefully, and if you look at several brain slices in a row, not just one or two, then usually you can um, get some useful information out of that. So that's what we did, and here we found that the later MRI scan showed clear enlargement of the ventricles compared to the day of accident CT. And here's another slide showing a level a little bit lower in the brain to make sure we don't have some artifact of, of slice angle. And again, we see that the lateral ventricles, particularly the posterior parts of the lateral ventricles, which are called the occipital horns, they're larger two years later than they were on the day of the accident. 